Miller's camp. That's where we spotted him from. That's the wide open ground we had between us. And that is where he was, just right over there when I finally got a shoot at him. And they went up there. But I lost him. I'm not certain that I uh, missed him or not. I'm pretty sure I missed him. Gun's definitely out. Um, got four bullets in my backpack. Let's see if we can get that fixed up. I don't know. Not a good day. Um, can't imagine what it'd be like to drop 40,000 bucks and have this happen. Ooh, that must feel bad. Anyway, here we go. Onward. scare him away. <clears throat> well, woke up alive again. Sadly, many won't because of the war on the other side of the planet. That was really unfortunate. Such a crazy times, man. There's so many crazy things going on. It's frustrating. Very frustrating. Crazy across the board. Man, oh man. It's hard not to uh, start the morning off on a big... All sugar and spice and... Sugar and spice and all things nice these days, right? It's tough. It's tough to start off bouncing around happy shit. So... What was I going to do this morning? I was going to go down to the river. I think it is about, what is it right now? It's 5.30. 5.30 a.m. I was going to go down to the river for first light this morning and see how many bears are down there. There is a pile of dead fish down there. And I was talking to one of the 
the kids uh, a few days ago, they said there is a monster down there, just a monster. They said, I think it was a grizzly. It's all kind of reddish brown. I'm like, no, it's not a grizzly. I got him on a trail camera from last year, too. It's a big bear. Can't wait to see him again. And then, uh, but Sarah's got to get going. She's got to go on a mega road trip to go pick up her knees. Got to take my truck and travel over here is an absolute gong show. So I can't go down there this morning, but I think I might go down there tonight and maybe I'll set up with the camera and I'll take you guys with me and we'll go uh, see how many bears are down there. I don't have any trail cameras down there. I mean, how many? I've already done that. I've done that a bunch of times. It's not going to change out too much, is it? Getting bears on trail camera in the back 40. Anyways, I'm babbling. I'm not even awake yet. <laughs> Obviously, I'm waking up right now. And I got a bunch of stuff to share. And I've been, now that I've been home for a couple days, I've been trying to organize a pile of information that I have to get it ready to be shared. And uh, one thing I did was I started. I started searching my inbox for various names of substantial contributors to this channel. And you remember Brian Stidham, who shares Mr. Ash's diaries. And I did a search on his name, and I, had, I think I had like 27 emails from him in my inbox. And I'm grabbing all those and trying to organize them and put them in one place. And when I did, I found two or three that I hadn't even, hadn't even opened. Now, he sent me this one with a photograph, and I know where the spot is. And in the email said, Good day, sir. I saw this in your video. Quote, the military writes in again, end quote, 8th of June, 2021. It says, you have a guardian. The Ojibwe called them. Oh, man, there's no way I'm going to pronounce that one. Gazadjawinanind. Gazadjawinanind. Winning and wag. Gizadeja winning wag. Misabe. I'll spell it. We'll see how you can do. G I Z H A A D I G E W I N I N I W A G. Giver. <laughs> says they know you. They're there to watch over you. They let you know when there's danger and lead you if it is necessary. You have nothing to fear of them. For the most part, you'll never know they're there. Safe journeys. Mitakoyo Oasin. Mitakoye Oasin. And he said two photos, and I put, I zoomed in on one of them. And I put it on the community page last night, and I asked, he asked people, hey man, do you see a face on this? And actually, you can make out a bit of a face in there. A little odd, I guess the only way would be to go back and and do that again. And I do know where that is. And that is, that is about, as the crow flies, that is about five, four or five hundred meters away from where those four logs are all leaned up on that one tree on the side of that rock face. That's where that is. So there you go. Shared. Definitely not the first time somebody sent in. Actually, I've had it have them. People have sent in dozens of screenshots from various videos of mine with circles in them saying there's beings all around me. I'm sure some are legit and some aren't. Does it overly concern me? Not really. Not really. Because I'm out there all the time, I know these things are out there. There's no way it can't happen the odd time, right? The frequency of me being out there, or where I go. But there you go. Take from what you will or leave it. We appreciate Brian, always, and everything he sends in to us. Always. Now, what do we got? Who do we got? Okay, here we go. Listen to this. This is titled... I think you saw something that happened to me. See, Steve, I have to say I never believed in Bigfoot. The rest of this paragraph is for you only because it would offend your viewers. Excuse me, I don't know if it's going to offend my viewers. Let's have a go. My background is as follows. Not that it really matters. But I say it because I don't trust many in the military. 
At 35 years old, joined the Marines on my 17th birthday. Alright, if it's going to go into your background, I will hold off because I'm going to get in trouble. Okay, I got gotcha. you. These days, my grandson, who is six years old, loves Bigfoot and all the BS, phony, scripted researchers on the History Channel and such. I routinely researched on YouTube for videos for him to watch for about a year because he loves them. Two weeks ago was the first time one of yours popped up, and I immediately thought, this guy knows something different. And I watched probably 20 of your videos. They brought back a memory. Something happened to me in 2004, about 10 miles north of Cheyenne, Wyoming. At the time, I was a nuclear launch officer at F.E. Warren Air Force Base. Sounds like this is going to get interesting. I was renting a room from a friend and his wife. One week, they went on vacation and left the two dogs with me, one older female and, and a younger female. There were no other houses or structures around his house for at least a mile, and after that, probably five miles. I always thought about how the house could be defended from people, but this night, close to midnight, the older dog began to bark at the back wall of the house where the ceiling meets the wall, which at the time I thought, was this a ghost, the way she wanted to attack something that high? But after listening to your videos, it makes sense because that was about 10 feet from the ground level outside, possibly the height of you know what. The younger dog began to bark and circle. The older dog then went silent and paced. I grabbed my 12 gauge A70 and it felt like the house was surrounded, but not by people. So I thought any animal could crash through the windows because they're only two feet off the ground outside. I set myself up in the middle of the living room where I felt I had the best chance to defend or kill anything that came in from any direction. It's pretty alarming, man. At some point, I also grabbed my M1 Garand and a flashlight. Then something huge hit the back wall of the house. The whole house shook. It wasn't like rocks or anything hard, but sounded like a 300 pound sandbag hitting. At this point I thought, here we go, and there was a loud roar or shriek that sounded like half mountain lion and half bear. I know how to think through fear, and got up and went to the back, opened the door, and shined the flashlight ready to blow anything away. Didn't see anything. Repeated the same at the front door. The older dog settled down almost immediately, and they both went to their bed took me a couple hours to get back to sleep because I listening for any, because I listening for anything I meant I was listening for anything I'm sure in the morning I looked around outside and see nothing disturbed your videos are the first time I heard anything similar to one email and one email sounded almost exactly the same people laughed and thought I was crazy a crazy old jarhead it gave me the creeps thinking back after hearing others accounts now I'm thankful to God I didn't come face to face with anything. I can see now. I can see how it could change your life. I think now maybe the older dog barking, snarling, and not backing down may have kept it at bay. I agree with many of your views in society and how you're trying to bring back power to ordinary people through sharing knowledge. Keep it up. God bless. I'll keep watching your channel, Hank. Hank, appreciate you, man. I hope you're safe. I hope you're still safe and well out there in the world and watching. And sharing your knowledge. Appreciate you. It's and that's another, it's another pattern. Slap in the house. It's a pattern, whether you like it or not. And it's funny, you know, it's the on average, the most of the canines go, it, they go into terror mode and want to hide and want don't want anything to do with whatever's going on out there. There was just the very odd time where. Dogs are not scared and actually want to go attack or they growl, they stay out in the open. But not very common, right? And it, that reminds me of back um, years back, uh, an old girlfriend of mine who lived near a place called Pool Creek, where a few friends might live, and also is right smack dab in the middle of one of the most traveled or inhabited routes, whatever, visited, whatever they do. And also where a couple went missing and is still missing today. Hikers. Right, like just down the road from her place. Anyway, 
Um, she had a Rottweiler that wasn't very friendly. Liked me, but uh, apparently chomped a few people that came into her yard. Big dog, big aggressive dog, very protective. And she had a two level house, and her bedroom's in the top. Half of the house, so how high is that? I guess at once you stand up, what would that be? Your eye level would probably be, what, 16 feet off the ground? Anyway, something was beating on the side of her house up in the second level, and her dog was crying its eyes out, crawling under her bed. And also, uh, the main road goes down the bottom of the valley, right? The driveway is to the rural houses, so it's all private property along the road. You can't get to the back 40, which goes straight up the mountain. And her backyard would have been on the, we'll call it the Duffy Lake, or the Duffy Lake Highway side of that valley, which is just up and over. And she had a hiking trail, an old road that went up, trail that went up the, the side of the mountain behind her place. There's a power line back there. I guess that's the power line, old power line service road. Anyway, years later, bumped into her. She also told me that she did her hike. She used to hike up that trail to keep in shape with the dog. And there was an ancient antique camera sitting right there on the trail that she hiked every single morning or afternoon, whatever she was doing, left for her. She said flat out, the Sasquatch left me a gift. They left me an antique freaking camera on the trail. I'm like, no way, that's crazy, that's wild. So where'd they get that, right? Where'd they get that camera? Anyway, sorry about that pattern, slap on the house always reminds me of the first-hand experiences that I know of through friends and myself and I experienced it too, and it's not fun. It's not fun. These are all, um, I think these are older emails. People waiting a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Very close up encounter with a flying humanoid in the UK. <laughs> it's a different title. Hi Steve, slightly off topic, but I believe it's all related anyhow. Yeah, no shit, man. You can't not be related, right? It's all in the same ball we're on. Oops, now the flat earthers are going to want to string me up. I said the word ball. <laughs> My name is Brian Poole, age 56. At the time of the sighting, I lived in the UK, on the coast, in the small seaside town of St. Anne's, Lancashire. The incident happened in early June on a Sunday in the summer of 2012. I was up very early taking my German Shepherd, Major, for his morning walk on the beach. To had a bit of context to call our town St. Anne's on the sea is a bit misleading. The tide is usually way out. We live on a tidal estuary. Most of the time it's good half a mile walk out from the promenade to even get to the tide line. I'll bet there's lots of delicious clams in there though that you could grab. And so it was on this lovely summer Sunday morning. The sun was already high in the sky, giving full daylight. That's when my encounter began. It was 6 a.m. in the morning. The beach was totally deserted, except for me and my dog. We walked half a mile across the sands until I was less than 50 yards from the incoming tide, which is always very shallow and comes in like a trickle. Just looking at the vista, I noticed to my left, coming up from the south, a small, dark dot. Low on the horizon? What made it unusual was that it was above the tide, and to my astonishment, was headed my way. As it got near to my position, more detail was emerging. It was what I can only describe as a flying entity or humanoid. It was silently hovering 8 to 10 feet above the water's edge, traveling no more than 10 miles an hour, and coming closer to my position, hugging the tide line all the time. Now here's where eyes will start to roll. The entity was traveling on some type of contraption, a silent hovering vehicle of some type. To describe the contraption the entity was riding on, I could only find a familiar frame of reference from my own memories, and so it reminded me of the British puppet show of the 60s, Fireball XL5, where they traveled on hover bikes. This contraption reminded me of those hover bikes, minus the handlebars. Again, this is just my impression. To continue, the intent, the entity or flying humanoid passed directly in front of me less than 50 yards away. 
It hovered right past me, still totally unaware of either me or my dog's presence. The entity was leaning right over the contraption, lurched fully over, head intently staring down at the tide line. I don't know if it was looking for something, or what it had or that it had never seen a shoreline before. It was so engrossed in staring down at the tide that it still wasn't aware of my presence. As it began to pass right in front of me, less than 50 yards away, I couldn't resist myself. I shouted out at the top of my voice, both arms waving, Hey you, over here! Hey, over here! The moment I did, the entity caught completely by surprise, almost fell off the contraption. It sat bolt upright, took less than a second to look directly at me, then, without hesitation, headed back out to sea. The entity, still in no great hurry, maybe 20 miles per hour, began gaining altitude in a series of jerky jumps to gain height. If you remember the old barber's chairs, it was that same sort of jerky upward motion. Then it would push forward. Then more jump jerky motion to gain further altitude and push forward. This continued where within five minutes it was up to approximately four to six thousand feet in altitude and approximately five miles out to sea. The entity, now a tiny black dot, disappeared into a huge cumulus cloud, the big white fluffy summer type. I, st <clears throat> I stayed staring at that cloud for 20 minutes. It never reappeared, so that was the end of my sighting. In total, from start to finish, the incident lasted approximately 20 minutes. I will now try to describe the entity. Eyes will start to roll again. The entity and contraption were both the same color, a dark tan brown, almost a distressed weathered leather color. It's almost like the entity and vehicle were molded. The description of the entity is as follows. The only frame of reference I can relate to come close to what I saw was the creature. In the first Jeepers Creepers film, it had the same dark leathery face, some sharp angled bone structure, high cheekbones, no helmet or head covering, no hair, but what I perceived as small bumps or nodules on the skull. I didn't see any teeth, but I perceived dark eyes with a tinge of white. No breathing apparatus, he was breathing out air. Hard to estimate size as he was straddling the contraption, but from my vantage point, looked to be of human height, maybe slightly taller and thinner. Again, just my impression. To conclude, the whole incident took place in complete silence, apart from myself shouting at the creature, so no humming or buzzing from the contraption. The only sound was the gentle lapping of the waves. Not even my dog made a sound, not even a whimper or a bark. It just stared at the entity cocking his head to one side. I felt no fear or I felt no fear or threat during the whole incident. The, the entity also showing no hostile intent to me either. It just wanted to get the hell out of there. As is always the case in these situations, my brand new state of the art Samsung smartphone was left at home being charged up. I could kick myself today knowing what I could have captured on video for all the world to see. High definition close up video of a flying humanoid or entity just 50 yards away in clear daylight and at sea level. I think it would have even surpassed the famous Patterson Gimlin footage. Anyway, Steve, feel free to use my name. I'm willing to sign any affidavit, swear in a stack of Bibles, take a lie detector test, be cross examined, whatever. I know what I saw that day. My testimony above is the absolute truth of an incident involving a flying humanoid on that fateful summer's June morning of 2012. Cheers, Steve, Brian. Brian shared, I don't envy you. Seeing something like that description and then sharing it with anybody is going to, like you said, make eyes roll, right? I can tell you right now, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. It's absolutely impossible for me to dictate to you that you did not experience that. Right? And I've seen some crazy shit myself. And so has hundreds of thousands, probably millions of other human beings out there today, right? So there you go. Take from what you will or leave it. And again, if you have seen something similar, 
obviously on average you'd probably make your average human go I'm not sharing that shit man that's just too much share it share it here with all the people you're in a safe place you seen it you didn't ask for it right it's not your fault share it share it get it off your chest it's time man it's time it's time to let all the cats out of all the bags let the truth flow no matter how crazy it sounds just get it out have I ever heard a description like that nope not yet not here anyway right and I don't follow any other channels that are dedicated to only stuff in the sky or what could be called UFOs or aliens I don't follow actually you know what I don't really follow many channels at all I don't have time but thanks for that share man I hope somebody else was on that beach the same day and saw the same thing and if they're here, they're probably going to go, okay, he shared, I'm going to share too. Next one, Bigfoot from a non-believer. Okay, here we go. Hi, Steve, my name is Dave. Feel free to use my name. I'll start off by saying I was a non-believer and have been one of those guys that made fun of a friend who says he's seen a Bigfoot. I live in Arizona about... I live in Arizona. About 10 years ago, my family and I were camping out north of the Mogion Rim in the White Mountains. It was approximately 9 p.m. and I started hearing a type of a grunt in the wooded area beyond our camp. 30 feet from us, my first thought was a black bear, but then I heard another grunt from about 20 feet to the right. Then another one to the right of there. Hold on a sec. Some barking going on. It's funny when you live rural, now you got that guard dog, you listen when they hear the bark, you listen to see what's up. Okay, that's not a bad bark. <laughs> Sorry. But you listen, that's why you got them, right? <clears throat> that's they're doing the job. This kept going on for about 15 minutes. I did have my sidearm out ready to defend my family. I've been a hunter for about six years. I've never heard a bear up close like that, and I'm believing now it wasn't a bear, but maybe a family of Bigfoots. I did shine my flashlight in the area, but never seen eyes or anything. I asked my dad what he thought it was, and he said some sort of bird, but I disagree. I've been camping in this area all my life, and I'm 48 years old now. Now my friend, about seven years ago, was in the same area driving down the 300 road, and he said he's seen a small Bigfoot or something on two legs run in front of his vehicle. I've since apologized to him, but I gave him a lot of shit about it. Then I found your videos online and really got me thinking about all the possibilities and beings that I now believe are out there. Well, I've ranted long enough. I hope you can read this and tell me what you think. Or you may email me back if you'd like. Thanks, Dave. What do I think, Dave? If you're still here watching the channel, you probably know what I'm going to say. And I am going to say, if that moment and it had that impact on you still this day and you felt compelled to find me or this channel or this email and and uh share that experience with us you already know what it was right you know what it was it's just it it i think i believe once we do have that alarming experience it just rattles us your average person who's not connected to a place like this channel or whatever and uh, you're forever looking for some kind of exp explanation or confirmation or acceptance that what you saw was what you saw or what you heard is what you heard right and then you find yourself here amongst us the rest of us looking for answers you know what you know what it was already you knew what it was before you started typing to me and I'm glad for your honesty and courage and braveness about coming forward and accepting the facts from the people, right? What's this one? This is a titled story. Hi. I hope this is the right address to send stories to. I really enjoy hearing people's stories on your channel. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I have two stories I'd like to share. Both take place in Lamoille County, Vermont and involve unidentified lights in the sky. The first story took place in a town called Walcott, pronounced Woolkit, 
why don't they spell it that way? <laughs> Isn't that a funny one? I always say that. Well, if that's how it's pronounced, why don't they spell it that way? <laughs> I was walking through a large field along Town Hill Road, which was maybe 1,000 feet in elevation with nice views of valley and mountains to the southwest. One night I was traversing the hay field to a little shack I lived in along the wood's edge when I saw a light falling from the sky. The light dropped what looked like 50 to 100 feet before breaking up into many individual lights before going out. I was immediately baffled what I saw. As I tried to reason with it, the first thing that occurred to me was this thing seemed lacking in energy or force. There's no sound or perception of the thing other than sight. Because of this, I immediately ruled out meteor because it seemed that it were that if it were a meteor, there would have been debris falling to the ground in front of me. And I'd be able to hear and smell it. But it was summer in the Green Mountains, which means lots of fireflies. So I thought maybe, maybe it was a cluster of fireflies about the size of a grapefruit that fell towards the ground before breaking apart. However, I've never heard of fireflies doing this. I felt pretty calm and unaffected by this experience. The next encounter with the light took place less than 10 miles from the first one a few years later. This one was clearly a craft of some kind flying through the air above the farm I lived and worked on in North Hyde Park. It was midwinter, and I was outside one night leaning against the chassis of an old hay wagon looking at the stars when I picked up some motion. At first I figured it was a satellite as it was moving steadily, steady, not blinking. But then I noticed the light had a direction to it, more like a beam than a spot of light. I watched for a few breathless moments as the craft appeared to be searching around the sky. After a moment, the light had clearly turned in my direction and was now shining directly at me. Nothing around me was illuminated, but I felt like the light had seen me. I remember thinking, here I am. I should also add that over the five years I lived in that cabin on that farm, I awoke in the night on numerous occasions to what felt like a camera flash through the window in the loft where I slept. I figured it was just my mind playing tricks on me as I was always asleep when it occurred. I would be jolted awake with the feeling that a bright blue light had woken me up. Then one night it happened while I was not asleep. I was in the loft staring at the ceiling when all of a sudden the hole inside of the cabin lit up with a blue light. If I hadn't known better, I would have assumed it was lightning, but the fact that it was a clear night coupled with all the strong flashes I thought I'd seen before had me baffled once again. Do you think these different encounters with lights could be connected? Am I bound, am I bound to run into Bigfoot next or what? Please let me know what you think. Thanks for reading this, Kyle. Man, I don't know. I haven't a clue, dude. I know that Anything and everything is connected here. It can't not be. I got sawdust in my eyeballs, sorry. Still from chainsaw all day yesterday. It can't not be connected. Everything's connected. Everything. Here. It's just, there is a whole pile of stuff that we are not aware of. We're not being shown. We're not being taught about. We have to discover ourselves so that we can do the teaching. <laughs> right? Think about that one. Not too many people think about that angle, do they? We are discovering truth so that we can teach the truth. Because nobody else is teaching us the truth. Right? We have to counter the false bullshit indoctrination that has been thrown in our faces since we we're that big. And we need to discover truth and share truth out loud so we can teach truth. So... Bright lights have obviously various different bright lights is a pattern, is a, is a, accompanies sightings of these beings. Obviously, if you've been watching, listening to the people here and gaining truth, that's what goes on. Bright, bright, glowing lights in the forest, but not particularly falling from way up in the sky. It's usually these lights are just cruising along at eye level or what have you in the timber, down the road, whatever varying the size from a tennis ball to a grapefruit to a frickin' pumpkin, right? Whatever. Some of them pulsing. Red, blue, yellow-ish, green-ish. Some people even claim to have seen some type of a being inside the light. 
I also know of a scientist I am connected to through scientists who saw a being described as what would be described as your typical Sasquatch climbing out of one of these damn things, hitting the dirt, running into the forest. Seen it. Crazy, right? So here we go. Here we go. More people waiting to be heard. They're going to be heard here. What's this one? This is marked as red now. Excuse me. Sasquatch print story. Hey Steve, appreciate all the time and information you put into the subject and the information and stories you provide all of us. It's too easy, my man. In July 2020, I was hiking a trail called Old Buck Trail, north of Deep Cove and south of Seymour Mountain. This was around when I got very interested in the subject of Sasquatch, including inexplicable structures and areas where there have been sightings. Okay, Old Buck Trail north of Deep Cove and south of Seymour Mountain. That sounds like outside of Vancouver right here, I think. As I was hiking this unmarked downhill trail and thought I knew where I was going, I mistakenly ended up lost down the wrong path. The very moment I realized I was lost, I could hear unnatural wood crunching and popping noises like something extremely big and heavy was moving above me on the hillside. The entire time I was walking this trail, I observed what looked like unnatural wood breaks and long trees piled on top of each other in almost what looked like strategic ways. Maybe I was purposely looking for these structures. As the subject was fresh in my mind, but to me it seemed too odd at the time. I decided to turn around and retrace my steps back to the last trailhead and loop back. As I was walking back through a wet area I had previously walked through and looked downwards for my footing, my heart dropped to my a-hole. As I looked down, I saw an at least 18 inch print which looked exactly like a Sasquatch footprint I've seen in the videos and, on and online. At this point my adrenaline went through the roof and I didn't even care about getting a picture of the print. I couldn't shake the thought that this being was following me for who knows how long. At this point I pulled out my phone and managed to get service enough to turn GPS on and find my way out of there. That hike back out was the one of the most fear-inducing adrenaline rushes I've ever felt in my life. I actually was so overwhelmed, I threw up and yelled, just F off you MF, as, he, as the entire way I could hear the popping noises getting closer and was so overcome by fear. This was for at least three kilometers. That, that last 100 meters, I think I ran out of the forest into my car. Never again will I hike Seymour Mountain or the surrounding area, I thought. Matt. Oh, there you go, Matt. Welcome to the club, buddy. <laughs> Welcome to the club. So, for you, you can imagine what it felt like for me to walk out in the dark when I was 18 years old. I was either 17 or 18. I must have been 18. After that sucker was right there looking at me. Mm, right? All by myself, dead quiet. You could hear a mouse fart from 100 yards. Yeah, he was right on your ass. Seymour Mountain, that'll be right here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Right? So just for you, Matt, just so you know, um, there is sightings with it. You could, you could be anywhere in Vancouver and look up and the tops of those hills, who knows how far up the hills. I call them hills. They're mountains, I guess, in a way, but they're hills to me. Um, there's sightings all around there. And I'm sure if you know Seymour Mountain, you know of Gambier Island, right? Very good friend of mine lives there. I've known him for over 20 years. And he sent me that photo that I've, you have used for the thumbnail photo on my videos a few times, that footprint in the snow. They found those prints way up high in the spring on Gambier Island while they were trials bike riding. And they were freaked right out. What else? I know of a girl who stopped at, you know that, oh, what's that beach called? Halfway to Squamish. That old, that old ferry dock down to the left, and there's a campground along the beach right there. Yes, she was coming back from somewhere late, late at night, and she pulled into there 
to because uh, she had to drive past Pemberton and she pulled in there to have a couple hours nap in her car and she could hear the scream slash roar above her so I'd be in the high side of the Cedar Sky Highway up in the up the mountain up there she could hear the roars from up there screams and then she heard them coming back across from the other side of House Sound from up there that's right around the same hood right and then of course I mentioned a few times before at the Whistler search and rescue team where there's apparently there's a trail from North Vancouver to Squamish up top there somewhere behind the chief and uh, they're looking for a person who went missing and they found 17 or 18 inch footprints and they emailed them to me on it was a hard ground well moss and everything so I mean you could just barely make it out but obviously they're search and rescue look they're looking for signs of this person everywhere right and they come across those prints it's not the first time they have come across the Sasquatch prints as well so there you go man Seymour Mountain of course they're there of course they're there I don't envy uh, I can relate to that description of your fright and I, and I don't envy being followed out like that and knowing what it is after seeing the print obviously yeah a lot of I think there's probably a lot of people who have vomited from the terror and they probably haven't even shared their experience they probably put it away and filed it away in the back of their head but anyway if you're still here watching the channel do me a favor and uh, if you can find that spot on your uh, maps mark it and screenshot and send it to me just for shits and giggles I like to see uh, roughly roughly where that was myself don't stop going out either all right man don't stop going out don't let it take you down went out what else do we got okay I don't know how that got in here so people sharing with me videos that I should watch which I get daily by the dozens and it almost drives me crazy so this is this one is titled Allegheny Forest market is red hopefully I haven't read it before hi Steve thanks for all you do it helps more than you know my name is Dan and my stories start in 2018 an old friend had come back to town for work and to be closer to his parents he used to work for a family for my family business when he came back he just fit right back in his dad back in the day had acquired some awesome land smack in the middle of the Allegheny Forest awesome cabin and gas and gas well roads access over 1,000 acres great hunting to say the least so me and my buddy are up there scouting for upcoming bear and deer season the cabins right there but when it's not too cold we'll just sleep out by the fire on cots this is around two-ish in the morning we're both out by the fire Jim's passed the F out I'm just having a smoke and watching the fire then I get all prickly and the whooping starts I tried to wake Jim but he's passed out never seen anything because it was too dark to see past the fire and there was no way in hell I was turning on the spotlight <laughs> that's kind of funny eh? I don't want to see you I just crawled into my sleeping bag terrified until I finally fell asleep the next morning I tell Jim about last night not letting on how scared I was I was like you got effing baboons loose out here of course he laughed at me never did harvest anything that year literally I didn't even see a squirrel while I was sitting the next year 2019 new season day before black bear we did our scouting I know right where I want to be this is the year I'm gonna get a big one I'm excited so I I'm up at like 4 a.m. everyone else is asleep generators are off so there's no lights I grab a Gatorade and a spotlight and go to have a smoke out on the porch I'm sitting there smoking it's pitch black out no moon I'm turning the spotlight on here and there to see what's moving and then I hear the most awful blood curdling deafening scream like a baby being murdered no it wasn't a mountain lion I've heard them before now I'm sitting on that porch in pitch black I can't see a thing but in my mind's eye this thing in my mind's eye this thing showed itself to me I knew it was female I knew where it was standing across the pond 150 yards from the cabin 
all above all else, I knew it wasn't just screaming. It was purposely screaming at me. There's no way I was picking up the spotlight. I did not want to see it. I was in sheer terror. I ran into the cabin, locked the door, ran downstairs where my bunk was, and cowered like a scared dog. I never told anyone about that. And again, no harvest. Skunked again. 2020, I haven't forgotten about my episodes of previous years, but damn it, I have a bullwinkle of a 12-point buck on trail cam. I know right where he's going to be. Well, it snowed like a monster. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm just going to drive my truck up as far as I can on this well road, then hike a mile through three feet of snow to get to a high point that's perfect. I finally get to my spot, get settled in, then it starts. First the wood knocks, then the whoops. These things are purposely ruining my hunt. My buddy, by the way, got the biggest buck in his life this year, a huge ten point. But it's like they are singling me out on purpose. I'll not be hunting there this year. That sucks. I don't know what, man. I mean, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the Dr. Phil of the Bigfoot Sasquatch world. I'm just, I'm an equal person. I'm an equal human being, just like all of you out there. We're all just here sitting at the same table. I'm the messenger. But from what I've heard from all the people, and uh, and what's somewhat worked for me is just just go there, say out loud, I know you're here. Leave me alone. I don't want nothing to do with you. Leave me alone. If you're spiritual, you can rebuke them in the name of Jesus Christ. It has worked for many people, right? It's a pattern. Whether you whether you accept that as truth or not, I don't give a shit. Take from what you will leave it, but it's a pattern, and it works for many people, right? But for for me, it has worked somewhat for me when I just say, just leave me alone. And a handful of years ago, I wasn't so kind about it. Okay? And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna even deny it. I got a mouth on me. I got some, I got some colorful language on me. And, um, I've used to say in not so pleasant terms, just leave me the F alone, you up and so and so. I'll put holes all through your head if I have to. Leave me alone. But I remember that terror, that fright, right? I remember the terror and the fright from being in that cabin with the wall getting slammed. I remember the terror and the fright I had when that thing was popping up, ducking down and popping up 30, 20 meters to the right in seconds. And did that three or four times. I remember that fright and feeling. It's just a weird feeling to be alone in the middle of nowhere when something is focused on you and doing something for you, intended for you, is very alarming. And also I remember that same place of that whatever it was getting blasted into that cottonwood tree in front of me. It scared the crap out of me. So that, all those experiences for me as I was gaining my knowledge, not talking publicly about this, um, it left me with a more of a threatening feeling in a way. Being scared isn't a good feeling for human beings. It makes you angry, right? It's just like when you scare the crap out of your friend. Damn, they get mad, right? Fright and anger, same thing. And, uh, and that would be why I would be have my colorful language and my, I'm going to kill your ass or I'm going to try to if you, if you uh, antagonize me. And now... I've changed my attitude somewhat. Now, I don't feel so threatened in a way. It's just a fact. Except they're sharing the same place I am. And I just say flat out, just leave me alone, man. I know you're here. You know I'm here. Let's not ruin it for each other, all right? There's somebody else down the road that might want to uh, bang on trees and hear you screaming in the face or something. But I'm, I'm not into it. Just leave me alone. I don't know. Things have been ramping up lately for me in the woods. I don't know why. And I've been talking to a few people on, um, who you know of. Oh, speaking of that, I will be traveling s not quite soon. I'm trying to. It's confirmed. But yes, I am going to travel to the States. I'm going to meet up with some people who have a lot of knowledge. And they're going to generously share with me. And I guess we'll learn at that time what they would what they would like me to share with all of you, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to go down. So now it's to the point we're just going to try to figure out the date. 
It won't be for, I don't know. We'll see. The date they proposed is in October. <laughs> we'll see, right? It all depends on my success up north. In the middle of nowhere. It's tough for me to make plans. Just because I got so much on the go, but there you go. Rambling this morning, aren't I? Rambling away. All right, well, here we go. What's this one? Okay, Mark, this is red. Northwest Territories, Alberta, BC experiences. Someone's been around. Hello, Steve. Sorry for the haste with which I wrote my first email. I was white knuckling my PH and my pen as I wrote, fully re reliving all of it. I mentioned I had other experiences. Are this one of those forestry guys? Did I read this? I, found it, I find it odd how they seem to be drawn to the same, yet others who pursue them for years are lucky enough to strike out. Ha uh ha. -huh. Meaning, yeah, that's kind of funny, isn't it? Some people, they are drawn to them without asking, and meanwhile, these other people are looking in purpose. No luck. Those people that say they desire to interact, see, I can get it. The allure. However, I don't think they get it. Some of these things are scary, some not. Like people are a dog, you know? Personality. And I'm confident to say, not the baddest thing in the valleys and ranges, mountains, typically near water. There are other things with malicious intent far scarier than. I am going to use your term because I find it to be the best I've heard. The free people. I do have that safe quality. Dogs, cats, kids, people. All seem drawn to me and have my entire life. Kids sound familiar. I might have read this. To the point. I said my aggressive energy in the woods was important when I was whooped through. Yes, through. LOL. I think I was being told from my vulnerable spot behind me that I wasn't the baddest thing on two legs of the river that day. The year that I was put in my place by Sasquatch was a strange one. Spring that year, me and three friends ventured to a hiking trail around a snake pit. Garter snakes were too early, but decided to go and loop the trail. Sorry, but decided to loop to the decided to to the loop trail typo hold on we were too early but decided to go loop the trail obviously nobody had been on it in some time going was rough waist deep snow in spots nope a little too early that spring huh we got to a spot thick brush i noticed a structure off the trail an opening i went in I could stand in the center, spruce boughs, and three areas inside. It's hard to describe. No axe marks. Everything bent or ripped. Outside one wall, I saw approximately a dozen rabbit carcasses. No way. Well preserved from the snow. All white. So killed in winter. Not spring. Not new. Heads all pushed in. Brains gone. Back legs eaten like you would a chicken drumstick. Front feet untouched and all in one pile. What does that? Okay, I definitely haven't read this. Two of the friends stayed on the trail. They began to cry. And eventually I had to leave. What? Two of the friends stayed on the trail. They began to cry. And eventually I had to leave. I went back by myself a week later. Saw the park wardens were out and they had... 45 gallon drums, two of them full of snakes. I knew one of them. He told me they were counting them because at another snake pit closed off to the public, they found over 200 snakes dead with just the livers taken, nothing else. A gash where the livers located. If you were chewed up, a mess he described. What does that? This is sounding pretty bizarre to me. We know what does those of us that aren't sheeple. But what does this? A couple weeks before I was, I was whooped at, I had finished my shift at the jail, 11 p.m. Sunday, summer. So I drive down by the river, maybe three minutes from work. I go down a steep road to the water pump house. The bottom's been flattened out so you can park. The river, about 20 feet away, I sat and watched the sky. 
then noticed a light coming across the river. Several, and they were tiny, but bright and orangey. They flew across the Slave River. Okay, now I know where you are. And up into the trees, up the bank and away. I was watching them one at a time. Then I noticed clusters, like most of them were golf ball sized. A few though, soccer ball. I watched in awe as they navigated the trees, never hitting a branch, diving up and down and around. I began to call I began to call PPL on my, all right, abbreviations. I, I began to call people on my phone. I needed someone to come and see what I was seeing. So I knew I was seeing what I was seeing, LOL. I tried three close friends, nobody was down. At 11.30 on a Sunday night, I must have seen, I'd estimate at least a couple hundred of them. As I talked and prior to the beginning to call people, I noticed they had left the trees and were now taking a straight shot up the road I came down. One flew at my front tire, then with precise movements went up and over the hood of my car. This is where the survival gene kicks in. I left then and there. And yes, you guessed it, Steve. What in the world does that? The same summer I left the Northwest Territories, where, this, where all this had happened, I went home to my dad's place, my family's from, Port Alberni, right here. And get this, my dad lives on the corner of Beaver Creek Road, just by the Petro Canada. <laughs> Thought I might find that funny. Fall time, I crossed the ferry, the last boat, I don't even remember the time. Dark out though, I went to Parksville, got food, rested by the ocean. Good to be home. I woke up and was like, fluff it, I'm going home. Port Alberni, here I come. It was about 1-ish a.m. I pulled into a roadside just before you head up, beside the lake. I won't mention. Well, we know where you are. I guess the only lake, right? I got out, walked down to the lake. I saw someone crouched by the water several hundred yards, several hundreds, sorry, several hundreds of feet away, far but in the moonlight, full moon. It was, it was up, out. I saw the figure clearly. Tall guy in black or dark gear, probably clamming. I felt like I was intruding. Just a feeling I received. I always listened to myself. I've learned to trust myself above all else. So I walked back to my car, parked under a massive tree, several trees around. It was dark in there. I sat opened the moon roof, windows down, it was peaceful, perfect. The window just went down. And I heard a thud, like someone hit the tree next to my car, then debris. Leaves and stuff began to fall on my car. No other sounds, just stuff rolling on, falling on the car. And this feeling of being watched through the moon roof. It retracted all the way back, opened right up. My heart raced, and dude, I did a four-wheel burnout when I hit the gravel-free asphalt. That's the, that's the extent of the big shit. That's enough for me, though. I've since re relocated to beautiful New Zealand. Four years since, I, since I've felt for real fear. Top of the food chain on land, zero predator. A year-round gardening season, surrounded by wineries. Fish daily, if you wish. Deer and pigs, goats in the hills. Steep hills, I mean steep. Haha, <laughs> paradise. For me, man, this is not about proving to anyone these things are real. I know they are. The proof sheeple can. I'll be polite. I just stop before I rant. I want some common knowledge to be shared among us. Something for my relatives and friends back home to know, to be safe. I've seeked out information over the years, finding the occasional elder to talk to, willing to share knowledge. I'll use the KISS method for everyone. Keep it simple, stupid. Be smart, be intuitive. Find that part of you and get in touch. It feels wrong even slightly than it is. Always stay alert. 90% of them just want to be left alone. Again, different personalities though. Some will harm you. Some will just be entertained watching you. Some, there are some that will harm you, and there are variations on the species, geographical adaptations. 
they do have an affinity for children. This, as a father, makes me nervous. We just don't know of the intent of them, and with the wide range of behavior, temperament, etc., so much like people, I would not leave my child unattended in downtown anywhere, or a small town everywhere, nor should you. And you really, I can't stress really enough, never leave them unattended near the woods, or in your backyard if you live rural. Damn, that's quite a ramble. Apologies for any and all grammar mistakes. I try to make it as easy as possible to read for you. And those cheap drugstore glasses, you rock, haha. <laughs> Just like so many good men I know. Take care, buddy, and remember to look up as well. Sincerely, Sunshine Clint Troy Deacon. Yeah, I don't care if you use my name. Names, no fear of ridiculous pussication. <laughs> Massey Cho Bro. Here's another one. Same person. I'm just sharing my own personal experiences. I'm now 40. First Nations, Cree, and Chippewan. My father is Irish, Dutch, my mother's First Nations. Although I've grown up hearing stories, my grandparents, my grandmother in particular, the Chippewan slash Cree woman from the North Athabasca area, my own father, countless uncles and friends, all whom I trust. I take it as yeah, yeah, the wee tegu as she called them, hairy people, will take you, she warned, women and children. First time at 13, I ran away from home, small town on the Northwest Territory, Alberta border, hitchhiking. Yeah, I'm adventurous to say the least. This is in the early 90s. I'd made it to high level, stayed two days, then one afternoon ventured out towards the Peace River. I got a ride to a reservation beside the highway. From there, I began to walk. It was early evening, summer. I could not get a ride to save my life. Seemed like the cars actually sped up as they passed me. I was big for my age, 5'8", 160 pounds, so I assumed I looked like a wild man. No shower in three days and long hair. It got dark fast. Tall trees made it darker. I walked. I had a ghetto blaster. I played Metallica in my mind to scare... I played Metallica in my mind to scare moose away. I wasn't really afraid of black bears. I grew up around them and timber wolves. Moose, I feared, though. My batteries died, the music stopped. at my life. I could hear branches breaking, and then steps, footsteps, unmistakable one after the other. I tried telling myself it was a bear. No biggie. I stopped, it stopped. Cars drive on by. I tried to flag them down, but I probably would have stopped. Wouldn't have stopped for me either. In the middle of Keg River and Manning, Alberta is nothing. I was flanked for nearly two hours. At points I was running. And so was it. Crash, crash. I'd run till exha exhaustion stopped me. I became desperate with fear. I've never been so scared. Literally trying to stop my heart so I could hear where it was. My heartbeat was so loud though. Finally I saw headlights and they were approaching. I turned towards them, reverse course, running towards the headlights. As they got closer, I began to yell and scream at them. Then I heard it. This roar slash scream. When I yelled, it screamed. I was on the center line, in his lane, and in his lane, zigzagging. I thought I was going to die a mystery. This guy's going to run me over first. He stopped, crying. I jumped in. I couldn't speak. He sped up, though. Must have sensed I was running from someone or something. A power line employee saved my life, I think. Now I look back and realize, if I wanted me dead, I, would have, I wouldn't have known it was there. Second time, fast forward only eight months. I'm, in, I'm 14. I'm now living with my dad in Rock Creek, B.C., outside of Soyuz. I'm left alone five days a week, me and the two dogs. It was heaven the journey I'd taken to get here. We lived basically on the creek. It was my backyard. I would take the 22, the dogs, and go explore. One day I sat on a rock, boulder by the creek. The dogs were at the house. I looked at them, laying by the door, which was wide open. Our next neighbor was two kilometers away, and she was hot. <laughs> Anyways, I sat watching up and down the creek. Then I saw a movement. A big, big black bear. But it was skinny and walking oddly. I've been taught those bears are dangerous, desperate. I looked at the dogs and they were gone. I listened for them, nothing. 
I look back at the bear to keep eyes on. No rifle with me. The house is maybe four steps away. Fifteen. Running. LOL. The bear come from the brush towards the creek. Then it stood up, walked across the creek in about four steps. I crossed there, the shallowest spot for kilometers. It takes me 20 or so steps. About two steps in, I stood up. I felt no fear, only awe, marvel. When I stood up, we locked eyes for a second. It felt like an hour. It turned away and kept on walking, just like the Patty film. Only not so broad. Built, I'd say, like Michael Jordan. I watched it cross, then it continued into the brush for 30 seconds, maybe, still on two legs. And here's where it gets weird, lol. I blocked out when it stood up on two legs for nearly 15 years. Then in a dream or a nightmare, depending upon perspective, I relived it. And each time I share, I recall more details. I saw its face clearly. It saw mine. Third time in the Northwest Territories, the gateway to the Wood Buffalo National Park. In my late 20s, I was working in corrections there and was an accomplished MMA fighter. I oozed aggression. That's important to the story. One day, I was overlooking the Slave River, standing high on a bank, maybe half a kilometer away from the river, on a U-shaped ridge. I was at the far point. You could drive to it often. You could drive to it, I often did. I'd go up there at a shadow box and occasionally kick trees. Conditions the shin. Mutai. I stood there, and behind me, maybe 50 feet away, I heard this, and I should say more, I felt this sound. A monkey-like whoop, only with lots of bass. It rattled my insides and shook my eyeballs. Truly, I felt the fear like I felt when I was screamed at all those years ago. And I kid you not, Steve, I effing flew. There was zero thought. It was all purpose, driven movements, muscle reaction, straight from my car. I dodged trees and hurtled the fallen ones. I recall flying over the hood, and with no wasted movement, I was in my car and speeding through what's basically a quad trail, or at least a truck. I had an Audi... Mitsubishi, Mits, Mitsubishi, couple typos there. I was moving, brother, terrified, nauseous, and effing sucked. There's more, but I'm sure I bored you enough. I'll say this though, from a chip of one elder, don't tree knock. That's how they tell you they see you or have. Knocking back tells them you are ex where you are exactly if they don't know already. Broken trees that look like barriers are just that. Respect them. Trees snapped and left sometimes point in the direction you may go. But you're on their territory. It's like a fence intent. They feel your intent going looking to exploit them. You will never see them. If you approach with kindness and love, respect and humility, you'll be okay. Tree breaks, knocks, vocalizations. They're all ways of telling you to back off those that don't we don't hear from again. Thank you for allowing me to release yet again and I hope and I hope share some knowledge. Take it how you want. Those listening sincerely, some shine. There you go. Read that again. Broken trees that look like barriers are just that. Respect them. Trees snapped and left sometimes point in the direction you may go. I don't think I've read that before. That's interesting. That's something to think about for a lot of people that come across that, right? Trees broken in the direction that you may go. Hmm, that's a new one. I've never read these emails before. I'm going to have to do some kind of a search and find out who was the, which was possibly the first one. Crazy, man. The terror. I appreciate you sending that in, man. New Zealand, been there. Yeah, it is steep, steep as F. <laughs> Got dropped off up in those mountains by helicopter and camped out and ran around the jungles up in there, man. That's a rough ass country up there. You get some, you get some legs on you after after living down there for a while if you're into the mountains. And what what they don't have in the way of animals to kill you, the vegetation will. That spear grass, that spear grass and shit. Yeah. 
anyway, interesting. Interesting. It's funny when you're saying uh, going down the highway and hitchhiking, people dropping right by you. I'm going to share this quick. It brought up a quick memory of mine. And I was sheep guiding a sheep hunt. If you, you Google it if you want. It's up the Racing River. And I was north of the Alaska Highway. Yeah, the Racing River. And uh, we didn't, I didn't have any radio or cell phones or anything back then. It would be myself and a hunter and a wrangler and a bunch of horses. And we'd ride way up the river and took another another offshoot to a different river and up to the head of that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Be about 10 hour horseback ride or something. And then we're in there for up to 14 days unless we harvest a big ram first earlier. So anyways, we got the, got the job done. And we rode it to the highway. And so what you do is once you hit the edge of the highway, you stay back in the timber and tie up all your pack horses to an individual tree, start up packing your gear. And then I had hitchhiked to town, <clears throat> excuse me, hitchhiked to the nearest gas stop, which is Toad River. And then I'm out there in the highway, cowboy hat on, have to shave forever, looking like who knows what. <laughs> I thumb out, intentionally left the rifle and didn't pack it with me to the highway. And the amount of cars that were driving by me was ridiculous. I'm like, oh my God, come on. Really? But then I thought about it. Well, then again, would I pick me up in the middle of nowhere? Like literally, you would have been driving for at least two hours of seeing nothing but the wilds. And then all of a sudden, here's this dirt bag on the side of the highway in the bush with his thumb out. <laughs> no vehicle in sight, no backpack, no nothing. And not the cleanest person on the planet. Yeah, it probably wouldn't pick me up either. But anyways, finally a pickup truck came by with some guys in it that I knew another hunting guide and some other fellows and they picked me up and I jumped in the back of the truck and they dropped me off at the coffee shop and I went in there knowing the owner's the coffee shop and I was uh, verbally sharing my frustration and I go, you would believe how many people drove by me in that highway. Man, if it was life or death, I would have been dead. And this poor couple piped up right there, this poor woman. I would, we would have picked you up but there was no room. There was no room for us to put you in the car with us and the kids. I'm like, oh man. Poor woman thought, she thought I was uh, trying to humiliate them or something. Never forget that moment. So yeah, I can relate to being in the middle of nowhere thumbing and everybody just driving around you with big eyeballs. That'd be really shitty to have one of those terrifying encounters going down and uh, hoping to God somebody's going to save your ass and they keep on driving. Not good. All right, who's next? Who is next? All right, here's a short one. Mark, this is red. My story, it's the title of this email. Hey man, just want to share with you a story from my childhood. I want you to read this just to confirm that what you say about our senses and the things that are there that we can't see really are true. My name is Cody Claggett and I am from Lexington, Kentucky. When I was a little boy of around five years old to about 10 years old, my grandmother had a home and when I'd go to visit her, I had a spare bedroom where my toys were kept. This room always made me feel terrified. Creepy. The hair on my neck would stand up and I'd feel that something was watching me. It felt claustrophobic and awful, like I was in danger. My father would stay there also and we would always sleep in the living room, making a pallet on the floor instead of sleeping in the nice comfy bed in that spooky room. I found out years later after my grandmother had moved from there that just before she bought that house, the woman who owned it before her was killed or murdered in that bedroom in a home invasion or robbery gone bad. Once I found this out years and years later, it all clicked in my brain. That's why I felt terror in that room. Whether or not it was the woman's spirit or just the memory of that awful murder ringing out, I don't know. But the room I was so afraid of as a child, now I knew why. Thanks for letting me share. It's not Sasquatch related, but it does demonstrate that our senses are extremely powerful. And what made me think of this was you talking about children maybe having heightened senses or that maybe our senses dull or something as we age, I don't know. But thanks for all your videos. I love the country you show in every video and I love hearing other stories. You can share my name 
a story of the like. All right. Well, it's a good one to mention about senses and being a child and being innocent and still having our raw natural senses before you write. They're getting dulled intentionally without a doubt. They're intentionally getting dulled. To me, it's intentional anyway. Take from what you will leave it. Yeah. I'm finding a whole pile of emails in a folder. All right, here we go. This is titled My Encounter. Hi, Steve. I've been following your channel for a while now. and really enjoy hearing all the encounters that you share. I've had an encounter myself, but was hesitant to share it, doing to be to being kind of tame compared to some you've shared. My name is John. Feel free to use my first name, but please, due to my job, don't mention my last name. I'm 54 years old and consider the woods as my church. I've been hunting from the time I could walk. I recently had knee surgery, so to get back in shape, I used to go on hikes locally here in Maryland at a place called Gunpowder Falls State Park. I was off of the main path with my two children and my best friend Scott, who is also an avid hunter. We had been walking silently along the Gunpowder River when we heard something from the ridge above us. Before we even had a chance to look up towards the ridge, a rock made a huge splash in the river about 20 feet away from us. I whipped my head up towards the ridge to see two upright silhouettes, one tall, probably close to 9 feet, and one shorter, around 6 feet, swaying back and forth, standing about 15 yards above us and behind some foliage. My buddy saw them, too, a split second later, and pointed up towards them. We heard chattering like whispers in a foreign language. There was like nothing either of us had heard before. We tried to keep an eye on them, but they moved further into the bush, virtually disappearing from sight. At this point, my kids started to feel really uneasy, and due to it being state property and not permitted to carry weapons, we decided it would be safest for everyone to cautiously back out of the woods. The whole hike back to the main trail was silent. No birds or other familiar forest sounds at all, just total silence. I've been back many times since that day, although my kids want no part of returning to that location. But never had any other sightings. I did find out, though, that there have been other sightings in that area. Sorry for the long email, but I just wanted to thank you and share my story with someone who would understand and not label me as insane. Keep doing what you're doing, Steve. It helps. Sincerely, John. John, thanks for the encouraging words, man. Appreciate it. And thanks for coming forward. Absolutely appreciate that and the location. I think we've heard that location before. And uh, um, I'm sure if somebody else has had an experience in that same location, they're probably here listening too, right? And they're probably going to chime in. Here's another one. One and only encounter. Let me say first that I believe and feel you and your mission to inform the people of these beings. Steve, you're absolutely the best and I enjoy all your videos and the message you bring. Thank you so much for the kind words. Appreciate that. As for my experience, well, it was September or October of 1970. My battalion had been called up to deploy to Vietnam. We're going through some intensive training to get ready to deploy. I was a PFC at the time, and being the only one trained as a scout, I was a scout as a squad leader and in charge of a six-man squad of scouts for a cavalry company. We were in Old Growth Forest of Fort Jackson, South Carolina. It was dark, very dark. Orders came down for my squad to scout ahead of the main body. We we're up against an aggressor force of trained Army Reserve Rangers. We moved ahead slowly and as quietly as possible. I moved ahead, now 300 yards in front of the main body, to a very large tree. I got in the prone position and watched and listened. All I could hear was silence. No bugs, no frogs, no nothing. I watched for three or four minutes. Minutes, there was nothing. I put my hand down to push up and all hell broke loose. What I had put my hand on was a booger's foot. 
He roared so loud I couldn't hear for 10 minutes after that. Well, I shot up yelling for my squad to retreat all the while firing my M16. Don't worry, they were blanks. Well, with all the gunfire and my company rushing towards me, the creature ran off destroying everything in his path. About 20 minutes later, a group of men all dressed in black fatigues showed up, taking measurements, asking a lot of questions, and telling us we could never talk about what we saw. I found out later from my platoon sergeant that it was 8 foot 11 tall and was estimated to be in weight of excess of 900 pounds. I don't think I wanted to hurt anyone. I think it was just curious. I hope that helps someone. I know it helped me to tell my story. Great job, Stephen. Thanks. Holy shit, man. I reached down and touched his foot, said no one ever. What's up with that? Why would that being let you get that close to it? Or did it have something to do with that being and that tree? Right? Sounds out there, but it's a pattern. It is a pattern that you can't ignore. People seeing these things. People have seen these beings saying that they are way, way too big to be concealed by that one tree, but half of the shoulder and head was sticking out behind it. What? What? Right? People see these beings disappearing into a tree. What? You know, how many times do you hear that description? Until you have, you just have to, you, gotta, you have to accept it as possible fact, right? Too many different witnesses. It's a pattern. What, 500 people around the planet just woke up one morning and decided to make up the same bullshit story detail and email it in here for us to hear? I don't think so. But anyway, it'd be interesting to know if that butt was protruding from that tree trunk or not. Who knows, right? We'll never know. The guys in the fatigues showed up again. I wonder how many of those guys in the fatigues with the dark cars, the helicopters, whatever, I wonder how many of those dudes are here listening to all the people. You, you know. You know some of them are, right? You know some of them are. And to those that are, I say to you, shame on your ass. Shame on your ass. You're just a human being like the rest of us. You grew up a kid playing in the streets, baseball, football, hockey, whatever, you're one of us, and now what, you're one of them, and you think that we are not allowed to have the same knowledge you have. Why not? Why not? Right? No respect for the men in black, or however you want to describe them. They can all kiss my ass. We're finding out on our own. <laughs> We're catching up. Fast. Rapidly. We're on your asses, right? We're catching up with the knowledge. Now. On my day, the sun's, well, the sun's not up, but it's fully light out now. And I have a lot to do. I'm like, I'm probably, I think I'm probably about four hours away from finally having all of my firewood split. And I ended up splitting it all by hand. I didn't go buy or rent one of those hydraulic splitters. I probably should have, but whatever. I like the exercise. Excuse me. I'm going to go start getting all of my gear ready that I'll be utilizing in the middle of nowhere. I think I'm going to do that today. I'm going to get Sarah ready to go with my truck. She's taking that. And then uh, carry on with my day and get some more emails copied and pasted. I have to email more people out there that I'm communicating with on this topic. And just keep the ball rolling. Anyway. Make sure you take your shoes off and ground yourself. That's important. Ground yourself out. Go stand in the grass somewhere. I don't give a shit where. Ground your body out. And make sure that you do something that you love to do. All right? Even if it's just for an hour. Make sure you do something you love to do. <laughs> Even though there's chaos going on around us all the time right now, it's ramping up. Make sure you do what you love to do. Make sure you do it. All right? No matter what. Take a little bit of time out and do it. Share my story at howtohunt.com. That's where you get your experiences shared word for word. All right? You found your people. Safe place.